Welcome back everyone to the Algebra Graph Theory Seminar. This week we have Gabor Liebner uh, talking about asymptotic uh, quantum stage transfer. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for organizing this seminar series. It was really, um, all the talks I've attended were really exciting and great. So um, I'm also honored to be invited and I hope I will not disappoint in this uh, nice series of talks. Uh, when when uh, Sophia first invited me, I thought that I'm going to talk about our recent results with Mark on fractional, pretty good fractional revival that kind of fits into the uh, series of things we've been doing. But then I heard Steve's talk um, a couple of weeks ago, and it reminded me that, that I have this older, older result um, that I don't think people know about, and it's kind of related to what Steve was talking about. So I kind of dusted it off and I'm going to try to present it uh, in, in this seminar instead of the fractional revival that you may have been expecting from me. So in any case, um, I'm gonna cross out this too because it's, <laughs> these technology is, is winning already. So it's, not, it's gonna be more than just two loops, but anyhow. All right, so I have to say that this is joint work with uh, Yonglin and, and uh, Xingqing Yao from Harvard. And it's been published a while ago. So this is really not a new result in any sense. But uh, the ironic thing is that back then when we first started thinking about this question, uh, I was completely unaware of the whole community around quantum state transfer. We came from a differential geometric uh, angle and our motivation was, was more from differential geometry than anything else. And so we use language that is slightly unorthodox maybe compared to what people in this community have been using. And we've been kind of going parallel without knowing about each other. And it was only when Mark came to Harvard that um, we kind of revisited these questions and, and then realized that there's, there's this whole other community doing this stuff. So, uh, that, that was probably a lucky, a lucky uh, coincidence, so to say. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to quickly run over the introduction on perfect state transfer and, and stuff like that. If you've attended more than one talk in this seminar series, you probably can ignore the first couple of minutes. And then I'll try to go into uh, more detail about our actual methods and, and results. So I apologize for that. So the main object we're studying is the continuous time quantum walk. We have a finite graph. We have a symmetric matrix associated to the graph, which could be almost anything. It could be the adjacency matrix. It could be some version of the Laplace matrix and so on. And then we're looking at uh, the solutions of the discrete Schrodinger equations. So uh, we're looking at a function defined on the nodes of the graph and, and time so that the time derivative is given by some kind of spatial operator. So the H is only acting on the graph. And then there's this complex I. And then uh, as usual, on a finite graph, you can write the solutions using this uh, exponentiated operator e to the ith times the initial vector that describes the initial conditions. And this is usually called the continuous time quantum block. And the reason it's kind of like a random walk is because if you start by a, um, an L2 normalized vector that has L2 norm one, then since this is a unitary operator for all t, it, it remains an L2 normalized operator, which means that the absolute value squares of the value of this vector can be thought of as a probability distribution on the nodes. Okay. Um, so there's this, there's this phenomenon in quantum mechanics called quantum tunneling where there's a particle that doesn't have enough momentum to cross over a hill that's the hill is built by some, some uh, energy potential. 
But in the quantum setting, it is still able to cross this, uh, this energy barrier, even though it's, it's, its momentum is not in the classical sense enough to climb the hill and then get to the other side. So this is called quantum tunneling. And, and of course, uh, quantum state transfer uses this kind of phenomenon uh, to its advantage to, uh, to communicate quantum states. But the way we, we were think, thinking about it first is, is sort of a, a discretized version of, of the uh, classical Euclidean uh, quantum tunneling. So what we're interested in is we fix two nodes of the, of the graph. We set the, uh, the initial state to be concentrated on the one node, and then we measure the probability that at time t, um, this, this random distribution how much of it is at, is at the other node. That's kind of the probability that your particle that starts at location U is at location V at time T. And uh, we say that there's perfect state transfer from U to V if there is some time where this probability is one. And that means that at all other nodes, it's zero. All right. And then there's this big open question that, that was uh, probably advertised by, by Chris Godzel from, from many years ago to, to really characterize which, which graphs and which pairs of nodes have, have perfect state transfer. And uh, still very little is known. Now, why is it called perfect state transfer? So there's this motivation coming from quantum communication. So you can think of the graph as a network of uh, the technical term is spin one half uh, particles. You can think of them as like a network of electrons where neighbors are in some kind of um, interaction with each other. They're coupled to each other. And then I want, like I control node U in the network and you control node V. Well, you should control node U, but anyway. Um, so I control node U and then I can initialize the network by encoding some quantum state at this uh, particle U and then let the whole network evolve according to Schrodinger's equation. And if you know which time to look and if there's perfect state transfer, then if you look at the right time and you extract the information at your node, you're gonna receive more or less the exact information that I encoded. So this has been uh, initiated by this, this kind of um, use of, uh, of spin networks or really spin chains at that time to transfer quantum information was studied first by Bose. And then this really exploded. And, and nowadays there's a, there's a huge amount of literature um, studying all kinds of variants of this phenomenon, including many people in this seminar. So. Now, I said that there are very few examples known of, of perfect state transfer and there's very little understood. Basically, for example, if you take a path graph, that's kind of the most natural thing that you would expect to have something like that from one endpoint to the other. But no, it only happens if the path has two or three nodes. For any longer node, for any longer path, you don't have perfect state transfer. And then there's some abelian Cayley graphs have perfect state transfer. There are some product join constructions, and then there are various sporadic examples, um, but no kind of general description. And then there are some, some known obstacles. For example, it's known that if there's an automorphism taking V to W, then there cannot be a perfect state transfer from U to V because kind of the idea is then when, when there would be perfect state transfer from U to V, it should also be from U to W. So that, that's kind of impossible. And this, this is also a discouraging result in my view that for, for a, a fixed D, if you look at graphs with maximum degree D, there are only finitely many of those that can have perfect state transfer. And typically, if you start studying this, you'll run into very difficult number theoretic problems very soon. So somehow, whether a graph has perfect state transfer depends a lot on the rationality or, or a simple algebraic or number theoretic properties of its eigenvalues. But those are, those are really hard to understand. Okay, so since perfect state transfer is so hard to come by, um, people have, uh, have uh, sought various relaxations. Um, 
one kind of direction that I've been involved in was to, um, to apply, so, so imagine this kind of network of quantum particles and these local couplings, what you can do, and apparently you can actually do this in an experiment, you can apply what is called magnetic fields to the particles. And then if you go through all the hoops of simplifying this to a model about continuous time quantum walk, what happens is you're really just adding diagonal terms to your symmetric matrix. So at each, each node corresponds to one entry on the diagonal and the magnetic field applied to that node is, is going to be reflected by, by a, a number in the diagonal of the matrix. So we looked at if, if you can use such a, a diagonal change to get perfect state transfer on paths and we found that you cannot, but there are infinite families of graphs where a potential in fact can turn the graph where it previously didn't have perfect state transfer into a, a graph with a magnetic field that does have perfect state transfer. So applying these magnetic fields has some benefits, but, but not really enough. Another direction which people have been looking at is, is a, a different relaxation of, pretty, uh, of perfect state transfer called pretty good state transfer, where instead of asking for a fixed time there, the, the state strength, the transfer strength is exactly one. You only want this kind of limb soup. So you're allowed to wait a long time and you're, you want the, uh, the probability of finding the particle at node V to approach one along a sequence of well-chosen times. So this is clearly a, a relaxation of, um, of, of perfect state transfer, but it turns out that there's still very limited examples uh, and still hard to characterize, but for, at least on paths, uh, a series of papers uh, have completely settled the question of when you have a pretty good state transfer between nodes of a path. And um, you can also combine the two, so you can add magnetic fields and then ask for pretty good state transfer. And uh, Mark and I and some other authors have, have worked quite extensively on these questions. But that's not what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about a third type of relaxation of perfect state transfer that I'm going to call now asymptotic state transfer. And it's, it's asymptotic in a different sense than pretty good state transfer. So in pretty good state transfer, you allow time to get large and you want the asymptotic uh, transfer strength to go to one. In this case that I'm going to talk about today, you also allow the magnetic fields to get very strong. And I'll back to the exact description later. So initially when, when I started working on this problem that was posed by, by, by Yao, who was my postdoc advisor at that time, uh, he, he was coming from, from this uh, physics background or physics point of view of Klein's paradox. So Klein's paradox says that there's not just this quantum tunneling effect that the, the particle can move through the energy barrier, but actually if you increase the size of the barrier, so you, you kind of make the hill larger and larger, it actually becomes more likely for the particle to move to the other side, which is completely counterintuitive because okay, it can move through, but you would, you would expect that if, if it's a, a taller hill, then the probability that it actually happens gets, gets less. But no, the, the probability as you increase the barrier uh, goes to one, in fact, in some settings. And what we wanted to do, um, so if, you, if, you, if you're a differential geometer or a mathematical physicist and study this question, you work in, in manifolds or Euclidean spaces, and then, there's a lot of, uh, of, of PDE stuff coming in and a lot of uh, things aren't well defined. You have to care about differentiability and so on and so on. And there's a lot of technical, there are a lot of technical difficulties that come from the geometric setting. So our idea was that we can actually do this on a graph where the nodes of the graph are going to play the, the kind of the physical, the, the, the roles of the physical location of the particle 
And uh, the, the discrete Laplace operator is going to play the role of the, of the PDE that, that is usually given by the, the standard manifold Laplace operator. So this is where we came from. And so in this setting, it's natural to look at this limit of making the potential very large because that kind of replicates Klein's paradox. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to fix a function W on the nodes. That's going to be our energy potential or energy barrier. And then we're going to take a large real number Q and multiply our fixed function by this Q. So this is fixed. Q is going to go to infinity. And delta is our starting matrix. It could be the adjacency matrix, it could be some kind of Laplace matrix. And this, this uh, matrix with this diagonal change is going to govern our continuous time quantum walk. So it's still the same E to the ith matrix that we had back here, here. So this H matrix is now not just the adjacency matrix or just the Laplace matrix, but we add this very big diagonal term. Okay, let's go back. And so, okay, so, so let me remark here that in Steve's talk two or three weeks ago, they, they he, him and, and, and Chris Van Bommel uh, considered a very similar setting, or, or I would say it's, it's a special case of this, where they just looked at the two endpoints of a path. But they were able to, to come up with, with kind of quantitative answers. And in here, we're not going to say much quantitative things. We're going to only say kind of asymptotic results. And so, in, 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 but on the other hand, I'm going to try to uh, strive for a, a bigger generality than just looking at the path. So, I want to study any kind of matrix of any kind of graph and, and try to keep things as general as I can, but I'm going to make one kind of uh, simplifying assumption that's not really necessary, but it makes life really much easier, is that my function, my W function is only going to take zeros and ones. So basically I choose a couple of nodes, I set the potential there to one and then to Q and leave everything else zero. So, so I have this matrix, this delta matrix and say in the simplest case that I'm going to talk about, I pick two nodes U and V and I put this Q entry here in the diagonal and the Q entry here in the diagonal and leave everything else intact. Okay, so this is exactly what Steven and Chris were doing a couple of weeks ago. But this setting will allow to at least add more Qs to the diagonal, choosing more than two nodes. But the two node case is what I'm going to be able to say the most about. Okay, so I'm going to say something about the more than two node case, but, but that's gonna be more limited. Okay, any questions so far? because I think I'm going to move on to the next chapter. I don't see chat, so if, if anybody's writing chat, please. Uh... Oops, and now my screen share died, so I'm gonna reshare, sorry. Okay, so let's assume there are no questions. I'm probably too intimidating, no, I hope. Okay, so I want to go and take the next part very slowly and I'm actually going to give things that, that may even look like proofs. I'm going to shove still a lot of details under the rug, but, uh, but I'm, I'm going to try to give all the ideas that go into this, uh, this analysis. So first of all, let's start with the basic definition. What even are we talking about? Um, so we have this graph, we fix two nodes. We start the particle from pure state X and look at the strength of or like this, this, uh, this phi T Y squared. So that's the probability that the, the particle is at, at Y. And I look at the supremum in T. Okay, so this is exactly what, what you would look for in pretty good state transfer. And I'm going to denote this by T X Y. But this depends on the choice of Q. Q was this large number that I put as, as loop weights. 
Okay, so so T secretly T also depends on Q. And then I let Q go to infinity and see what happens. And I claim that one of three things will always happen. Either the limit of T is going to be one, in which case I say that there's asymptotically perfect tunneling. This was the case in the, uh, this was uh, the case of the path, the two endpoints of the path in Steve's talk. But when you look at more general graphs, it's possible though quite rare that this this TXY is going to have some intermediate limit between zero and one, but I say there is asymptotically partial tunneling. And in many cases, this limit will be zero when I say there's no tunneling asymptotically. So in that case, no matter how high you build your hill, the particle will never cross or will actually cross less and less likely. So the goal of this talk is to characterize when these three things happen. So you give me a graph with two nodes, I should be able to say exactly when either of these things happen. And kind of as a, as a corollary of everything, we'll also be able to say something about how soon this happens. Now, there is no exact time when, when something asymptotic happens, but you can still bound the order of magnitude how much time you have to wait until you see, uh, until you start to see this kind of asymptotic tunnel. So we're going to be able to, to say kind of exact asymptotics on the first time there you see something like uh, a tunneling effect. And I'll show really nice graphs at the end to, to convince you about that. Um, Check your time. All right, so how do we do this? So we start from this very standard way of expressing uh, this, uh, this continuous time random walk using the eigenbasis of the matrix. So, so let uh, psi one, psi n be uh, an orthogonal, orthonormal really. eigenbasis of, uh, of H. And let me denote by lambda one, lambda n, the corresponding eigenvalues. And then this formula here gives exactly the value of, of, of phi t of y if, if I start the particle from x. So, so this is under the assumption that, uh, that phi, phi zero of x is one. And so in particular, how close can this get to one? All right, so what is my matrix? My matrix is a fixed delta plus this Q times some diagonal. And in particular, for the case when there are two nodes, this diagonal has only two terms, two ones and then zeros elsewhere. So instead of looking at this matrix, I can divide by Q and look at this matrix here. And this doesn't change the eigenvectors and only changes the eigenvalues up to a scaling. So this is just as good as my original matrix. And this matrix looks like a, it fits perfectly into the, the, the perturbation theory in, in linear algebra, right? I start from some fixed matrix and I add something that's very tiny because Q is large. So one over Q times Delta is going to be tiny. And what I want to understand basically is how this changes, how this affects the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So, so instead of looking at H, I'm looking at this one over QH, which, which is like this diagonal matrix plus epsilon times delta. So if epsilon goes to zero, which is what's happening, 
you can you you know what what the uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues will converge to because this diagonal matrix has only two entries that are one and zero everywhere else. This is my diagonal. So what are the eigenvectors of this? Well, it has a double eigenspace with eigenvalue one. Right. Come on, stop doing that. This word is eigenspace, okay? With eigenvalue one, and then everything else is zero. So when you perturb it, most eigenvalues are going to remain zero, and most eigenvectors are going to be zero on these two nodes. So after epsilon perturbation, what's going to happen is n minus two eigenvectors are very small on x and y. And they're not going to contribute much to this formula here. So we can kind of, and as, as epsilon goes to zero, their contribution goes to zero. And then we have two eigenvectors that form an, ortho, that form an orthogonal basis of this two-dimensional space. So they're going to be something like zero alpha, zero beta, zero, where alpha and beta are two entries. And then there's going to be negative beta alpha, the other one. So it's going to be this two by two matrix restricted to those two nodes with, with alpha plus alpha squared plus beta squared equals one. But we don't know ahead of time what's the value of alpha and beta. It could be that alpha is one and beta is, or like alpha is one over root two and beta is, is, is one over root two. That's similar to the case of perfect state transfer, but it also could be that alpha is one and beta is zero, in which case there's no state transfer whatsoever. Okay, so, so let, me, let me explain this uh, in a different way. So we have this double eigenspace. And after the perturbation with epsilon, de epsilon times delta, this double eigenspace space splits into two distinct eigenvectors. But we don't know ahead of time what two eigenvectors. Are they the unit eigenvectors? Are they some kind of diagonal vectors or something in between? Why is this important? So suppose, imagine for a sec, that the perturbed eigenvectors are going to look like this. Then if you plug it into here, you get that phi t of y equals e to the i t lambda one minus e to the i t lambda two times some constant. And then since lambda one is not never going to be equal to lambda two, if you wait a sufficiently long time, roughly on the order of one over lambda one minus lambda two, so the difference of these two eigenvalues, at this moment, um, these are going to have opposite phases. And so phi of t is going to be roughly one. There's probably some constant missing here, but anyhow. So at this time, the e to the it lambda one, and then there's maybe a pi here, two pi. And the e to the it lambda two is going to be such that these are going to be opposites of each other. So they're, after taking difference, they're gonna have magnitude two over two is gonna have magnitude one. But it could be that after perturbation, you get Psi one of x is zero and psi two of 
and psi one of y is one, and psi two of y is zero, and psi two of x is one, and then this psi t of y is always going to be zero, no matter how long you wait. And there's all these intermediate cases when, when something crazy happens, right? So let me summarize what's going on. We have the diagonal matrix. It has the double eigenspace and all, all other eigenvectors are zero on these two nodes. Then you perturb. The double eigenspace, <laughs> double eigenspace splits into two eigenvectors that are mostly concentrated still on these two nodes. The rest of the eigenvectors remain small and we don't care about them. And the, the double eigenvalue is gonna split into a, two single eigenvalues. Now, in terms of deciding whether there is asymptotically perfect state transfer or there's asymptotically no state transfer, what you need to decide is how does the double eigenspace split? Does it split into these two kinds of vectors, in which case there is going to be asymptotically perfect tunneling at, at this time, or it splits into these two vectors when there's going to be asymptotically no tunneling, or there's the third case when, when uh, these two vectors split into some non-trivial alpha, beta, negative beta, alpha, in which that's going to be the case when there is asymptotically, asymptotically partial tunneling. Okay, I'm gonna talk about that last. These are the, the more, more typical cases. So either the double eigenspace is going to split like this one or like the previous one, mostly. But how do we decide? Okay, so that's the main question that I want to answer. Given a graph, and then I take the diagonal matrix and I perturb it by epsilon times this, this delta, how can I tell which of the two cases will happen? And I claim that there's a, a, there's a very concrete answer to this. Okay, so, so that's this kind of last question. We have two eigenvalues and by the way, it's easy to see that both of these big eigenvalues, these lambda one and lambda two, are going to be on the magnitude, on the order of Q. Um, their difference is still going to be very small, but both of them are going to be very big. And then what we want to understand is what happens to the eigenvectors. Okay, so, so here comes maybe the most important idea. And I'm going to explain this, but I'm pretty sure that if you dig deep into the, um, uh, into the perturbation theory literature, this is definitely um, a degenerate case of perturbation theory. But I'm, I'm, I'm like 95% sure that, that somewhere in there, this can be extracted. So I don't claim that this is anything new that I'm going to, to show here. Um, we definitely discovered it for ourselves 10 years ago, but, but now I, I'm, I'm very certain that you could dig this out of the, the perturbation theory literature somehow. So let's see what's going on. And my motivation was random walks, and I, I really love every time I can do that, I use them, I'm going to use them for something. So how do, we, how do random walks come in here? First of all, there's this uh, so-called Dirichlet problem. Dirichlet problem in classical geometric setting, you have some domain with some boundary. You prescribe some function on the boundary. And then you look for a function that extends this into the interior. And such that this F is say harmonic. Now, there are methods how to, and it turns out that for, for a, a large class of, of functions G, this, is a, this is a, has a unique solution for a bounded domain. And there's a really nice way to think about the solution. The solution that, that can give you this harmonic extension is, uh, it comes from Brownian motion or random box. Basically what you do, if you want to define the value of F of X at some given point X, you start a random walk from X and you stop when the random walk hits the boundary. It's going to hit the boundary eventually like random walks in two dimension like to do, or even this, this is true in any dimension for a, a compact domain. Um, 
And then let's call the time t when, when, when this hits the boundary, you take the expected value of g at the time when this stops. So you kind of run a million experiments. You run a million random walks. You see what points they hit the boundary. And then you take the average of the function g that's prescribed. And this turns out to give you a, um, a harmonic extension of the function g. Now, we're talking about graphs, but you can do the same thing on a graph. So let's now draw the same picture, but think of it as a graph. So I'm going to take a subset of the nodes. This is going to play the role of the boundary. And I have some prescribed function on L. And I'm looking for a function on the whole graph that extends G and such that uh, Laplace of F is zero. So Laplace, let, let, let Delta denote now the, the standard uh, Laplace operator. So this is what harmonic means, right? That, that the value of F at any node is equal to the average of its neighbors, which is encoded by the Laplace operator. So this is purely motivation now. Um, this theory is gonna work for any matrix, not just the, the Laplace, but it's maybe the most uh, intuitively clear with, with the Laplace operator and harmonic functions. So you can do this kind of random walk approach. So take a node X and then define a simple random walk on the graph. To the first node being X and then every step you, you move to a random neighbor equally likely. Um, so you take this random walk and you stop when you, when you arrive to L. So let T be the, the first time that this random walk is in L. And then I'm going to write down a probabilistic formula that's gonna serve as my definition of the function. It's gonna be the expected value of G at XT. Again, formally, what this means is you run a lot of experiments. You always start a random walk from your node X. Um, you wait until it hits your boundary. There you look at the given function and then you take the average. Now, why is this gonna be harmonic? This is really easy to see. Just checking time. Um, it's really easy to see because imagine that you take one step with the random walk. So here is X, and in the first step, you move to some neighbor Y. It has maybe three neighbors. You, you're equally likely to move to one of the neighbors. And then from then, you start the game again. So if you move to Y, then you start a random walk and you wait until you hit the boundary. If you move to this point, say this Y1, Y2, then you wait until you hit the boundary. So in one step, you move to one of the neighbors, equally likely, and then you, you start the game from the neighbor, but that's gonna give you f of y. So this, is, this, this equation comes from the definition of f of x. Just from the definition that I defined it using the, let's take this random walk and wait until it hits L. Okay, so this is true if X is not in L, of course. If X is in L, then this makes no sense. Um, there's no, no process, there's nothing to do. So this is only true for, for nodes not in L. Okay, great. Now, how is this relevant to anything that I was talking about previously? Uh, this, is a, this is a really cool picture, by the way. I, I think every person working with Laplace matrices or like any graphs should, should have this picture in, in their head. But now what I want to do is I want to use this method to find eigenfunctions of this, of this delta matrix. So instead of asking for an F that is harmonic, no, I'm not going to ask for that. 
I'm going to ask for an f that is an eigenfunction with some eigenvalue negative lambda. So the setting is the same. I have the graph. I have the boundary. I have some fixed function on the boundary. And then I look for an extension to the rest of the graph with this property now. So previously we wanted Laplace f equals zero or f harmonic or f equal to the average of its neighbors. Now what we want is, is Laplace of f equals some multiple of itself. So this, this is going to be some other eigenvalue of the Laplace operator. And I claim that you can basically repeat the same argument. You just have to tweak the definition of this f slightly. And basically, the new definition that you want to use is something like this. You want to take the expected value of g of xt times a factor that serves to correct for this lambda. And this correcting factor is 1 minus lambda, 1 over 1 minus lambda to the, to the number of steps you took. So it's the same process, except there's this small change. So you start from a node in your graph, some node X. You take this random walk, you step, step, step until you hit the boundary. There you look at, okay, what's the, the prescribed function value at the boundary? And then you multiply, okay, how many steps did I take? I, I take this one over one minus lambda to the T factor. And then I average this over many runs of the experiment. See if lambda is zero, you just, re, you just recover the previous formula. There's no change. And it's, it's a very simple homework to check that this exactly gives you an extension of f or of g that satisfies this Laplace f equals negative lambda f. Are you still with me? OK. So it's still unclear why I'm, I'm talking about this. But now I claim that this method will help me understand what are the eigenvalues, uh, what are the eigenvectors of this matrix that I was talking about. So I, I wanted to understand the eigenvalues of this, uh, of this perturbed matrix, this diagonal plus epsilon delta. And I'm going to think of it this way. And I want to really understand what the, what the values of, this, of these eigenvectors are on the two nodes. So suppose someone told me the answer. Someone told me what the values of, this, of these eigenvectors are on those two nodes. So I take the graph. I take x and y as my boundary. And suppose someone told me what is psi of x and what is psi of y for a given eigenfunction. And someone also tells me what is the eigenvalue. So this is no. Then I can say, oh, great. Now I know how to build the eigenfunction everywhere else. I can just use this formula. I'm not going to use f because this is going to be my, my eigenvector psi. For any other node z, I can take the expected value of now psi of uh, xt, but now xt starts from x0 is z, times 1 over 1 minus lambda to this uh, t. So this formula gives me the exact values of the, of the eigenfunction everywhere else. And then, I can, I can do the following sanity check. So let me, let me repeat what happened. So there was this graph with these two nodes. Someone came in the door, right there, the door's right behind me, and tells me, OK, I know that the eigenvector you're looking for has this value and this value and this eigenvalue. And then I can use this formula to build the whole eigenvector. But now that I know all this information, I can do a sanity check, and I can say, Hmm, let's see, does this function really look like an eigenvector now? Well, 
So is Laplace of psi equal negative lambda psi everywhere? Well, it's going to be true here. So the only place where there's some question is the nodes X and Y. And you can write down, and it, it's going to be like a two by two matrix condition to write down that indeed the whole function is going to be an eigenfunction like you want. Um, but the entries of this matrix will depend on lambda. So it turns out that there's an if and only if condition, you can write down the two by two matrix with entries depending on lambda. Such that if this two by two matrix has this as an eigenfunction or an eigenvector, then, then everything was fine. But if this matrix doesn't have this uh, eigenvector, then, then it wasn't fine. In fact, I can use this matrix to find these, the, the, the values of psi of x and psi of y, because it turns out that this matrix doesn't depend on these two values. It just depends on the graph and lambda. So, so here's the summary. So given the graph and given these two nodes and given lambda, I can write down this two by two matrix with the entries depending on lambda. Such that the eigenvectors of this matrix, they're, they're gonna be two eigenvectors, are exactly the restrictions of, of the eigenvectors I'm interested in to these two nodes. Now, everything I said is only true when this lambda is this large eigenvalue, one of the two large eigenvalues. There are some convergence issues and some other kind of issues. So this, this whole story that I told you works if, if you're talking about one of these big eigenvalues. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work to get the other eigenfunctions, the, the, the kind of the, the small eigenfunctions, but we're, we don't care about them, so that's good. Now, the thing is that the entries of this matrix turn out to be power series in one over Q. So, so you should, you, it looks like you need to know lambda, but it's enough to know Q after some, some kind of technical transitions. So basically what we end up having is we have this um, two by two matrix where the entries of this matrix are power series in my potential one over Q. So one over Q is very small. So these are power series in some small term. And all you want to do is find out what are the two eigenvectors of this matrix. Now, this isn't everything. There's some really cool things showing up in these power series. If you, if you do, if you work through all these computations, you get that this power series here, it looks like something like this. It looks like one of some one over Q to the K times delta the delta to the K X Y. And this entry is going to be sum of K one over Q to the K delta to the K X oh, Y Y sorry. And this entry is going to be the same with X X and it's symmetric. So it's not just that I have this two by two matrix whose entries are power series in my big potential one over Q but I can actually know the coefficients of these power series and they depend on kth powers of my initial matrix that I'm perturbing by. And now we can finally answer what's going on in terms of um, the eigenvectors. So this is a symmetric two by two matrix. Everyone should be able to tell me if delta is like the Laplace or the adjacency matrix. 
what is the smallest non-zero power of this power series? So the, 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 the smallest degree, smallest non-zero degree is what? Okay, I'll tell you. It's the distance of X and Y in the graph. If delta is like an adjacency matrix, because how many steps do you need to get from X to Y? That's their distance. And that's the first K that's gonna appear here. So these, this power series is going to be like epsilon to the distance plus some larger terms to higher, higher degree terms where epsilon is one over Q. Now the diagonal entries are gonna be different. These are gonna start at, at epsilon equal, like epsilon to the zero or even, even. So this is going to be like one plus epsilon squared times something plus epsilon cubed. And these numbers are, are going to count number of loop, number of walks of length two, three. So this is going to be like the walk generating function basically. So now you have a matrix, epsilon is small. The diagonal entries are like one plus epsilon squared plus and so on. And the off diagonal entries are much smaller. They're like epsilon to the D. So unless some miracle happens, this matrix is going to be very close to the ident identity matrix. And then the eigenvectors are just going to be the regular eigenvectors. So unless some miracle happens, Uh, the two eigenvectors are going to be like, uh, like this. Like that's the bad case. Because again, the, the diagonal entries are going to be very large and the off diagonal entries are very small. And it turns out in this case, you don't get these one negative one uh, eigenvectors. So what's the miracle that needs to happen? What needs to happen is that actually all the entries in these, in these two power series have to match up to degree D or higher. If that happens, then you can, you can subtract a large multiple of the actual identity matrix and you end up with a matrix where now the off diagonal entries dominate. And then the eigenvectors become this one negative one and one, one that you're really looking for to get the state transfer. <sighs> okay, so that was the, the, the uh, kind of hardcore part of the talk. So, so now I'm ready to state all, all the results and I'm kind of going to rush through them, but maybe at least the most important result I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in detail. So given the graph and these two nodes, you can look at some kind of notion of spectral symmetry around them. So basically you want to find up to how far the walk generating functions uh, match. And I'm going to call this a number. It's going to, I, I'm going to denote this by the cospectrality of these two nodes, the largest M for which all powers be up to, up to M from zero to M. If they agree for every number, that's classical cospectrality, then this co X, Y is, is infinity. So you can think of this as, as sort of a, a quantification of classical cospectrality of two nodes of a graph. Classical cospectrality asks for all these powers to be equal. And now I'm happy if they're equal to up to a large number. What should this large number be? Well, it should be equal to the distance of the two nodes. So this is the, uh, the answer to the question I was posing at, at the beginning of this part. If the two nodes, so suppose the two nodes have degree D, you look at how, how large, how much are they cospectral? You, you look at their quantified cospectrality. If the quantified cospectrality is at least D, then there's gonna be perfect asymptotic tunneling between them, perfect asymptotic state transfer. If their cospectrality is less than D minus one, then there's gonna be no tunneling. And then there's this really strange case when the cospectrality equals their distance minus one, in which case there'll be this partial tunneling. And 
this kind of reflects on, on the talk of, uh, of Steve from, from a couple of weeks ago. They, they, have, they made this exact observation that the time to, that takes to, uh, till tunneling is, is going to be of the magnitude of Q to the distance minus one. So it's a pretty bad scaling of the time you have to wait until tunneling. We can recover this in this, in this more general setting using basic perturbation theory, really. Not, it's nothing more than that needed. OK, so to summarize, because I think I'm running out of time, what I talked about is I have a graph. I put two large loop weights on two nodes and ask, is this going to be enough to get asymptotically perfect tunneling from one node to the other? And the answer, you can, you can answer exactly. You have to look at this kind of cospectrality of the two nodes. If their cospectrality is larger than the, their distance, or at least as large, then you're going to get perfect tunneling. If it's smaller than the distance, then you're not going to get it. Now, if the graph has an involution, so it's a symmetric graph that maps x to y, like the path, then of course you're always in the first case, because then they're, they have, they're just cospectral. But this works also for graphs that are non-symmetric. The two nodes could have cospectrality, um, large cospectrality, even if they're not symmetric, and then adding large loop weights is going to induce asymptotically perfect state transfer. And then we did the same analysis for putting loops on three nodes, and then we get some, some much more complicated answers that I'm, I'm just going to run through. I'm going to show these pictures. So, so this is my graph. I choose the two nodes that are marked here, 4 and 15. Um, here you can see that their distance is 5 and their cospectrality is 9. So you get perfect tunneling. And um, the red and the blue measure the, the, the strength of, the, of this phi function at as a function of time. And you see that time needs to be really large. Uh, well, this is probably for a large potential. I don't remember exactly what, what value of Q we've made these plots. And this fuzziness here that you can see on the tops and the bottoms of these curves is due to these, the effect of the small eigenvectors that we've kind of ignored. Then here's an example of partial tunneling. If you look at, oh, I forgot to mark these notes, but if you look at these two notes here, uh, 1 and 15, they turn out to have distance two and cospectrality exactly one. And there you see that this, this level isn't quite one. There's this gap here. And it's never going to close. So this curve will never actually go all the way up to one. It'll always stay below, below this line, which there's, there's a constant gap there that you can compute from the cospectrality. So this is a case when there's partial tunneling, but it's not perfect. And then there are cases when the, the cospectrality is too small, then you don't see any tunneling. The red curve stays at one, and the blue curve is down here. It stays at 0. And then you have similar pictures with three valves. There are more, some more interesting phenomena that I don't have time to talk about. And then I want to mention really quick further work. So. The, the, most, the most interesting that I want, to, I, I want to emphasize is this one. So I want to emphasize that this is a purely qualitative anal analysis. So we, we can't say much about how big this potential needs to be to get tunneling, how strong the tunneling is going to be for a finite size potential. So very much in the spirit of, of, uh, of the analysis of Chris and Steve, with that they can actually write down quantitative estimates on the path how large their loops need to be to get a, a reasonably good tunneling, it would be really interesting to generalize that to, uh, to, to other graphs. And I believe that this framework is going to be useful for that. So um, I, I think that, that that's a really interesting uh, question. May, may even have applications to actual quantum communication stuff. OK, so I'll stop here. And thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Are there any questions?
um, I guess if you could just go back to your example, say you didn't really talk about um, the the three three UL cases. Yeah, yeah. If you could okay, yeah, like I can, I can, quickly I can talk, talk about, about that. that for a bit. Uh, there's one there's one really interesting thing that I I, I can contrast in the two and the the, the three UL case. So basically. In, in, this, in this other case, what we do is we take a graph with three nodes, uh, x, y, and z, and I put values of, of large loop weights in, on these three nodes. And now I want to see what happens if I start the particle at x. Is it going to go to, to y? Is it going to go to z or what? And this depends on the pairwise distances of these three uh, nodes. So let me just say, call these distances A, B, and C. If A is smaller than B and C, then what happens is that this node is basically ignored by the other two. So poor Z is kind of excluded from the game and there's gonna be tunneling between X and Y if they have enough co-spectrality. It's more interesting if A is equal to B and C is larger. So say, X, Y, and Z have the same distance, like X, Y, and Y, Z have the same distance, but X and Z are further from each other. So it's kind of like this. In that case, it, it turns out that there is tunneling from X to Z, perfect, asymptotically perfect tunneling, and it's actually faster than this, uh, than, than it would happen if this wasn't here. So that there's a speed up of tunneling from, uh, from Q to the Z, Z minus one, or C minus one, sorry, to Q to the A minus one. So it, it looks like this, this third node is, is like a, a, a jumping board for the quantum tunneling. And there's a picture corresponding to this uh, here. So this is X, uh, Y, and Z, I guess. And so you, you start a particle at X, that's the red one. And you can see that at some time it's gonna be, most of it is going to be at the middle point, but then suddenly it goes all the way to the third point. And this is the short time scale. So this is like the, the Q to the A minus one time scale. And then if you look at the big time scale, which is Q to the C minus one, then you can see that there are these quick green, red, green, red alternating things. Those are kind of the tunneling from X to Z. And then somewhere on the long term, they become kind of messed up and then they're smoothed out again. There's this interesting dynamic in the long term. And there's the last case when it's an equilateral triangle. Um, you need some space to draw that. So when, and all the distances are equal, then there's something really strange going on because due to the non-monogamy phenomenon, in this case, if the whole half symmetric, so there's like a, a Z3 symmetry, then there's no chance of any kind of perfect asymptotic tunneling from, from X to Y because, because of this, uh, this involution thing. So if there would be from X to Y, there would be from X to Z at the same time, and that cannot happen. But if you break the symmetry far, far, far away, do something here and break the symmetry, then suddenly you, you can actually get asymptotic tunneling from X to Y, perfect. So I'd like to contrast these two cases and then really uh, finish talking. In the two node case, when you only put loops on two nodes, everything depends only on a finite neighborhood of the two nodes, this, this radius D neighborhood. Whereas as soon as you introduce a third loop with the same, same weight, then it becomes a global thing. So there's no finite neighborhood of these three nodes that, that, decides the, that, that ultimately decides the behavior. It can be that that there's some really, really distant change in the graph that completely alters the behavior. So there's, there's some, some kind of non-locality as soon as you have three or more loop weights, which I think is really interesting contrast compared to the two, two loop case. Okay.
Perfect. Thanks.